Hello everyone and welcome. Welcome to tonight's session um, brought to you by Bowel Cancer UK tonight. Tonight's session on managing peripheral neuropathy is one that I know so many of you are, are just so keen to know lots about, about, find out some tips about managing it. We've had such an incredible sign up response and it's lovely to see so many of you joining us tonight. Um, so hopefully an hour from now you'll have had some of your questions answered um, and we'll have taken away some top tips um, to, to help manage your neuropathy a little bit better. So before we get stuck in, um, there's just a little bit of housekeeping for us to do. You'll see at the bottom of your screen, you have a little speech bubble button um, called chat. So if you haven't discovered the chat function already, that's where you can send messages to everybody. That's all the participants, all the panelists, um, just say hi to everyone. So it would be really lovely if you just want to pop in there who you are, um, tell us a bit about yourself, say hi to everyone. And you'll also see that some members of the brilliant Bowel Cancer UK team are also in the chat and they'll be popping up links to um, documents, links to resources, Resources that get mentioned um, and just generally keeping us all um, on track, a bit like the sheepdogs herding me as the sheep, I think, is what they're doing. Um, the other button that you can see is um, the Q&A button, and that's where we really want you to pop any questions that you think of during the session for our brilliant speakers tonight. So if you pop your questions in the Q&A box rather than the chat, because we can't see them in the chat, um, in, and, and therefore they won't get asked. So if you've got any questions, please try and remember to pop them in the Q&A box. Now, just to warm you all up um, for this evening, I always love to ask a few questions about who's joining us, where you are around the UK and who you're with. So we've got a quick poll, which should appear on your screen right now. And we'd love you just really quickly to tell us where you're joining us from. Um, really hoping for a Four Nations UK spread. Yes, look at that. We've got a Four Nations spread, which is brilliant. A um, couple of people in Scotland, a few in Wales, a couple in Northern Ireland, and lots in England. Brilliant. OK, so let's see. There are the results. Excellent. OK, so now our next question for you is... How many people are you watching with? You might be on your own, but you might have somebody with you. Um, that This might be like a major event in your household. Who knows? So if you can just tell us how many of you there are with you right now. Um, any moment now, that poll should appear. Here we go. So is it just you? Is it you and a plus one? Is it three? Is the magic number? Or maybe there's a gang of you. And then there's a second question, which is just really helpful for us to sort of get an idea as to, to, to who those people are that are joining you. So if you can tell us a little bit about them, is it a partner, um, a friend, family member, somebody who cares for you, just give us a little indication of who's there with you. So we've got lots of people with plus ones. Brilliant. So that gives us a really good indication of how many people are actually watching rather than the number of people that have just signed up. Brilliant. So we can just see the results there. Lovely. We've got looks like we've got lots of partners joining. So welcome to everybody. Um, and as I say, hopefully by the end of, of today, you'll really have something you can take away that will be really valuable um, to helping both you if you have bowel cancer and also the person that you love and are supporting. OK, so. Just to let everybody know. Today's session is being recorded. We record all of our sessions. What you put in the chat is completely anonymous. That doesn't appear on the chat, so don't worry about that. But it does mean that we can then package up the, the, the session tonight and pop it onto YouTube. So if you perhaps don't get to stick it out to the end today or halfway through it, you think, oh, what did they say? I wish I could go back and watch that again. You will have the opportunity at the end of, of the session tonight in a couple of days time we'll be sending you out a link to the session where you can watch it again and you can share it with anybody else that you think would find it helpful the other thing that will be happening is that we'll be asking you for some evaluation just to let us know how you found the session did we have the 
did we pitch the information right? Was it, you know, too complicated? Was it too basic? Um, you know, were there things that weren't working? I can see from the chat there were some problems already with the submit button. Um, so that's, you know, it's really good for us to have lots of feedback, but it's also really important for us to enable us to continue to keep offering these sessions for free um, to, to you, the bowel cancer community. It's really important that we can show how valuable they are to people when we're talking to funders and asking them to support our events so when you get that evaluation form if you can fill that out that would be brilliant um, and i think we're also going to pop the link as well in the chat the only other thing for me to say to you tonight tonight we're stepping up the tech and you're going to see some qr codes so hopefully you're familiar for, with them the sort of little square box that's all a little bit fuzzy made up of dots um, there'll be various points during the event where a QR code might appear on screen. So if you are, have an Apple phone or an Android 8 or later device, all you have to do is just open your camera and point your camera at the squibbly code um, and it takes you where you need to go. Some people who have phones that are a little bit older might have to have a QR scanner app, but please don't worry if you haven't got that sorted because and if that makes no sense to you, don't worry, we're going to send you the links to everything that we're talking about. So the QR code is a shortcut way for you to get there really quickly. If you don't have time or you don't have the, the wherewithal on your phone, don't worry, because you will get the link afterwards. It's just us testing out to see whether or not QR codes are something that people um, enjoy using and find easy. So I think that's enough from me and you've done some work. So I think now it's time to introduce you to our brilliant expert speakers for this evening. It gives me enormous pleasure to introduce you to Lauren Irwin and Beth Selwood. So Lauren is a senior specialist oncologist and haematology occupational therapist at Guy's and St Thomas NHS Foundation Trust in London. Hi Lauren. And Beth is a seat they have brilliant job titles. Beth is a senior specialist oncology and haematology physiotherapist um, at Guy's and St Thomas too. So welcome to you both. It's brilliant to have you here. Um, as we were saying before we came on, this is something that you know, so affects so many people um, and there's clearly a real thirst for information and advice. So enough from me. I'm going to hand the control over to you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, so good evening, everyone. Thank you all for joining us. As um, we've already been introduced, I won't do that part. Um, so this evening, we're going to be discussing chemotherapy-induced peripheral neuropathy. And throughout the presentation, we will be referring to it as CIPN. So the contents of today's presentation is an overview of what CIPN is, how it presents, how it is classified, what it actually means to us and you as patients, we will briefly explore the causes and then lead on to some management strategies. So including some current evidence, some techniques and strategies that we may use. And then as we've already been made aware, there's obviously opportunities to ask questions throughout that we can address at the end. So starting with the basics, what is peripheral neuropathy? So peripheral neuropathy is a definition given to a type of injury inflammation or degeneration to a smaller nerve branches. So generally the ones that we have at the ends of our hands and our feet. So there may be many different causes for what could cause a peripheral neuropathy. The main ones that you might be aware of are diabetes and vitamin B12 deficiency, and then within cancer and chemotherapy. So this leads us on to CIPN. So this term is used to describe peripheral neuropathy that has arisen secondary to the chemotherapy given. It's one of the most common side effects, however, can affect people on a varying spectrum of severity. Now, there are certain types of chemotherapy that are more likely to cause longer or lasting symptoms, but there can be other degrees, other factors that may influence the degree in which those symptoms might affect somebody. 
and how long they may or may not last for. So what is CIPN? So CIPN is described by the paresthesia type symptoms. So you've got things like tingling, prickling or burning sensations of the skin. Now, commonly this will be bilateral. So that means affecting both sides. So for example, both hands or both feet, or in some cases, both hands and feet. So it could be intermittent or constant. So intermittent meaning that it will come and go and constant meaning it's, it's there all the time. Generally, it is isolated to the hands and feet. So as you can see by the image on the screen, it's almost a glove or sock type presentation with the effect in how much it affects the body. It can continue after treatment has finished. The severity of which it might affect somebody varies quite considerably. And certain agents, as I mentioned before, may predispose someone to it more frequently than others. In some cases, CIPN may be transient following a chemo infusion. So what I mean by that is when you receive the chemotherapy agent, you may experience some of those symptoms I've just described. However, they may then quickly resolve or go away completely. That would be an acute transient experience of CIPN. It is also important to note that there should be reported to your medical team supporting your care if you do experience those symptoms, particularly during or after treatment. In other cases, it may develop over time or after treatment's finished. It may persist for several months and in some cases for years. And it isn't always clear in some cases whether the symptoms may be more permanent um, in the more chronic chronic presentations. Now there is an unknown trajectory of recovery and in some cases patients may experience minimal change in those symptoms that have developed and in others they may, may experience a complete resolution of those symptoms. CIPN is, is challenging to classify and unlike other peripheral nerve injuries that might occur secondary to a surgery or, or trauma, the extent of the axonal damage that occurs will aid the classification and then therefore direct the recovery. Now, as you can see, this is a diagram that demonstrates several grading criteria that have been developed for the use of CIPN. However, as you can see from them, there's no clear objective markers that can be used to aid the grading of this symptom. So as a result, this might mean that grading is subject to an individual and might differ from one clinician to another. Hence why it might present some further difficulties. So what does that all mean for you? Well, our bodies are made up of two nervous systems. We've got the central nervous system, your brain and spinal cord, which is the control center. I'm going to use an analogy of motorways. Love this so, one. <laughs> <laughs> for example, brain. this one is the motorway. So it's sending the messages back and forth, several different lanes, several different directions. And in this sense, it can generally adapt very well if there's an issue in the pathways or if there's any minor damage or issue. Because there are other lanes, other routes, other options to go round or divert traffic into the other lanes. So generally we wouldn't expect you to notice or experience any symptoms if this was affected following the chemotherapy. You've then got your peripheral nervous system, which supplies mainly your motor and sensation. So your ability to use your muscles and the feeling in your body, as well as other things. So this starts with slightly larger nerves, and these act as our A roads, dual carriageways. So they still carry a lot of traffic, both directions, and again, can compensate usually relatively well, because there's alternative routes, or if there's one lane closed, actually the traffic can still get round or get where it needs to get to 
it might be slower, but generally, again, it, it copes, it can manage. Then we've got our more our smaller peripheral nerve endings. Now these are much smaller. These are the ones that generally tend to the end in the hands and the feet. These ones we would describe as our country roads. So these tend to struggle if there's an issue. So there's no way to get around. So if there's a blockage, there's not an alternative route or there's not another lane that can be used. So that then presents with symptoms. So in this case, those nerve endings that are much smaller that get impacted by the chemotherapy, they haven't got a way of compensating and sending the messages an alternative way. And that's then unfortunately why the symptoms will then develop and are more likely to persist. I hope that analogy makes sense. I'm sure in some cases, if you don't drive, it might not make as much sense. <laughs> Hopefully you, you followed me mostly. <laughs> um, right, so now we're delving into the minefield of what causes CIPN. Now it's complicated and it's often widely accepted in the literature that it's not fully understood. So I'm not even going to try and describe all the complexities within it. But what we do know is CIPN is often correlated with certain types of chemo agents, which means the risk of developing it may be higher in patients that will be receiving those chemo agents. There are other risk factors to developing CIPN. Now that might be that you've had numerous courses of chemo over the, your time period of receiving treatment. Um, and there are other risks that can be identified. Now that doesn't mean that in every scenario, every risk can be eliminated or identified. Now, in some cases, it may be that someone's deemed higher risk. However, there will also be cases where this symptom does develop and actually it wasn't necessarily expected or anticipated. One of the challenges is that it's, it is described within your chemo consent process, but it, it's often amongst all the other symptoms that are reeled off. So it's, it's probably a little bit overwhelming to take on board all of those things and really understand that. So there are several different pathophysiological processes that cause CIPN, and these differ for each chemo and also in each individual in some cases. So there's discrepancies within the literature as to which is most likely to cause that damage. Um, and it's, it's known that that's multifactorial. But what we do know is it, it does cause damage to the, the nervous system secondary to the neurotoxicities within the agents that are given. Um, CIPN symptoms usually emerge within weeks or months after completion of chemo or during chemo. The severity is usually proportionate to the cumulative dose. So the more chemo that's given within the body, so the later stages of your cycles, the more likely that those symptom burdens might also accumulate. Now, in some cases, patients may actually develop symptoms once they've completed their chemotherapy infusion. So it might be after you've completed chemo that then these symptoms start to develop. Sorry, Beth, I'm being slow. That's okay. <laughs> there. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so what have we learned so far? So it is a really difficult symptom to experience and it can have a varying degree of impact on each and every individual. That being said, there are things that can be done to aid managing these symptoms. It may not always be possibly possible to completely resolve the symptoms or cure the symptoms. However, we certainly aim to address the extent in which they impact your daily life. The other thing that we wanted to just mention was that if you are experiencing a high degree of pain as a result of these symptoms, mm. that you would liaise with your GP or oncologist because there are some pharmaceutical, pharmaceutical management options that obviously we can't discuss as therapists, but 
the medical professionals would be able to advise you and whether that would be appropriate for yourself. So there is that. We won't delve into that today. So we've discussed a little bit about the symptoms that present things like pins and needles, extreme cold, tingling, numbness, joint stiffness, sensitivity, pain and weakness. Now, what that can mean is actually that there's an issue with being able to do things, practical things that day to day you need to be able to do. Things like doing your buttons up, washing your hair, opening jars, cutting vegetables, putting earrings in, holding things, gripping things, taking things out of the fridge because it's too, it's that sensitivity from the cold is, it just causes that extreme pain. So there are real daily impacts that that might have on your day-to-day -day activities and that's where it becomes problematic more problematic similarly symptoms within the lower limb would present with the same symptoms as above the main difference or the main symptom in addition to that would be the sort of impact it has on your balance and your ability to walk could be affected if that were to be affected so you can have sensations of walking on on unusual surfaces sometimes it feels like you're walking on sponge or you've got something underneath your feet now again there's a huge importance around foot health because it may be that you haven't noticed that you've caught your toe or stubbed your toe and actually then there's a risk of infections or wounds that we would obviously promote you regularly checking your feet if your sensation is is impaired when the balance is affected, it will also create a higher falls risk. So understanding that that needs to be considered and actually there are certain things that we can do to manage those risks. So it's just being aware of those things. And then unfortunately that then results in, in an overall reduced quality of life. Lots of feelings of frustration, social isolation, a loss of muscle strength, stopping being able to engage in those things that you enjoy, a reduction in independence and inability to do the things that you want and need to be able to do. So now I'm just going to hand over to Lauren, who's going to talk a little bit about the evidence and then go through some strategies so that we can help address this triage of things to try and mean that it doesn't have so much of an impact on your day to day lives. Thanks, Beth. Sorry, my slide control, I think, needs something <laughs> to be desired. <laughs> um, <laughs> so I am going to talk to you a bit to start with just about evidence. And we're going to be really honest. This is an under-researched area, um, generally. Uh, we have limited level A evidence. And what I mean by level A evidence is evidence derived from multiple randomized clinical trials or, or meta-analysis or, or things like that. So we don't have a, a, a massive amount of that sort of evidence in this area telling us what works and what doesn't. Um, however, the good news is what we do have a lot of is things like case studies, expert opinions, theoretical knowledge um, and things like that. So we tend to base our treatment largely on, on patient experience and clinical findings uh, and draw on our experience from peripheral nerve injuries or neuropathies caused by other comorbidities, which can work similarly. Um, and sort of while we're thinking a bit about evidence, some more good news is that more is being done. So at the moment, we are currently working with uh, King's College on a CIPN research study, and there are various other bits of research going on. So I think we will see more emerge in this area, um, hopefully in the coming years, but just at the moment, our, our body of evidence isn't, isn't huge. Um, Beth talked sort of earlier about the uh, severity grading systems. Uh, often medical teams will use these as it's sort of best practice. Uh, there are lots of different options. So it may be that different teams use different um, grading systems. Uh, and they, as Beth said, they, they can be a bit subjective, uh, but also can be quite helpful. Uh, again, when we're looking at outcome measures, we try and use outcome measures for CIPN as well, just to get an idea about how, um, 
how well our interventions have been working and, and get a gauge of outcomes. Uh, again, it's tricky because CIPN is, is quite a subjective experience. It's, it's difficult to capture that data, but, but there are outcome measures that we do tend to use as part of our best practice. There is just a bit at the end of that slide, uh, quoting from a bit of evidence. Uh, and although we've popped that in, Beth and I are really aware, you know, having worked quite extensively with the symptom, um, that a lot of people actually don't don't find that this time frame fits in with what they've experienced. And people are experiencing CIPN symptoms sort of ongoing or for, or for long periods after treatment. Um, but just a bit of extra info from the evidence for you. So when we work with people to help support with CIPN, there are a range of different therapeutic components we might use within our, our interventions and our treatments. Most commonly, we'll use these components in combination, uh, but sometimes we might focus more in on you know, a specific component depending on the individual person's needs really um, and I'm I'm going to talk you through what each of these sort of components might look like uh, I think what I'm going to cover is probably quite general information uh, what Beth and I know is that what works often works best is an individualized approach because everyone is very different and because although the symptom may be being caused by the same thing, how people experience the symptom is very different. What works for one person or what helps one person doesn't necessarily help the next. So often the most effective approach is a tailored approach. And so that is why we do encourage you to sort of seek therapy support and have an assessment, an individual assessment for yourself, as that is often the most effective approach. Um, so, can I move my slide? We will start with the um, educational therapeutic component. So, like lots of symptoms, having an understanding of the symptom is often the best starting point when thinking about how to manage it. If you don't understand it, how are you going to manage it? And Beth mentioned earlier about the fact we find CIPN is sometimes a little bit lost earlier on in diagnosis and treatment. Understandably so, there's a lot going on and there are other possibly more important conversations and symptoms that are, are, are more needed to be addressed sooner. So sometimes it's something that hasn't been fully explored and perhaps people haven't had explained to them, um, or it's not something that is so much of a problem until down the line um, and, and people didn't get that explanation at the beginning, so it takes them by surprise. So this educational component starting point can be really, really helpful. Having an understanding of what CIPN is, what the expectations are, you know, what the considerations for recovery are, how it might impact you from a day-to-day -day functional level and how to talk about it and how to report it um, are all really, are all, it's, it's all a really helpful starting point when we're thinking about how to manage this symptom. So moving on to um, another therapeutic component that we use, which is a, a compensatory therapeutic uh, component of our treatment. By compensatory, we mean things that might help compensate for day-to-day -day problems being caused by a symptom, especially when we can't necessarily do anything to immediately alleviate or, or make these go away. Uh, so there are lots of compensatory ideas out there that might help manage the impact of the CIPN symptoms. Um, and as it affects people very differently and people's lives are very differently, often different people come up with very different helpful ideas. Uh, so just some ideas for some compensatory techniques. So things like um, using oven gloves to hold both hot and cold items, uh, wearing rubber gloves when you're doing the, the washing up, um, using aids to help open jars and bottles if you're struggling with strength and sensation. Uh, jewellery that's got easy fastenings and openings that can often be quite fiddly. Um, using clothing that, that hasn't got fiddly but buttons and zips and is perhaps elasticated if you're in a rush. 
um, sensible footwear, ideally that's sort of flat with closed toes and isn't backless. Things like bath mats, non-slip bath mats for the for the shower or the bath. Uh, if you're checking water temperature, perhaps using a part of your body where the sensation is is normal um, before bathing or before before washing up, uh, just to make sure you're safe. Uh, planning ahead if you're climbing the stairs, not carrying too many items, making sure you're having adequate rests. Uh, it, thinking about covering door handles if, if cold sensitivity is a problem and your door handles are, are metal. Um, thinking about removing floor rugs, trip hazards, anything that might get in your way, clutter, might be easy to fall over, particularly if your balance is impaired and, and we know that that might be more of a risk. Um, tools to make handles bigger if gripping is difficult, things like pen grips, and you can get cutlery that's a bit chunkier, things like that. Some people have suggested um, Velcro stickies on computer keys to sort of help with, with typing and stimulating while typing. Um, and just thinking really carefully about how safe you are if you're going to drive and whether you're safe to do that or not. Uh, these are just some of the ideas that would fall under this uh, compensatory component. Uh, th there are lots of others, but, but just as some sort of starting ideas, um, there, there are some of them. So next, we're going to think about um, symptom management and, and control treatment components. And the success of these really varies from person to person because everyone is different um, and and you know like I said what what works for one person doesn't work for another and again the evidence base for these is very much of an anecdotal nature uh, it's people having reported that that these sorts of things have been helpful in some way um, and again we would suggest you know these sorts of things are really really helpful to be assessed on a one-to-one -one basis with a therapist um, to really tailor what, what they're advising you and which strategies and how you use them. Um, so really helpful to have that individual assessment. Um, but just to give you an idea of what some of these symptom management and control co components might be. So desensitization is at the top of the list there. So after a nerve injury, Sometimes the nerves within the skin can become overly sensitive um, and stimulation to the skin in that area can feel unpleasant, painful, oversensitive. You can try and reduce these feelings by deliberately overloading the sensitive nerve endings with different stimuli. And you might do that using different textured materials uh, or a basic massage pressure technique um, to do that. Again, immersion therapy falls into that desensitization concept, uh, again, where you're looking at immersing sensitive areas of the body in different stimuli to try and help reduce that sensitivity overall. And then you've got the sensory re-education um, element. And, and again, and this is another way to help nerves recover from injury. And what it does is look at teaching nerves or reteaching how to recognize different shapes, different textures. Um, if you've had a nerve injury, particularly for the hands, this one. Um, so another potentially quite useful strategy. Next, I'm just going to group the, the tens that you can see there and the pain together. Um, so some people find the use of a tens machine helpful if they're experiencing pain as one of their CIPN symptoms. And the tens machine just uses uh, electrical impulses that can reduce pain signals that, that go um, to the spinal cord and the brain. And some people find that helpful. Um, and again, if you're experiencing pain, uh, as part of your CIPN symptoms, like Beth said earlier, we really, really recommend you talking to a medical professional by way of a doctor, um, because there are a range of pain relief that can be used specifically for nerve pain or, that we know are, are perhaps better for nerve pain. Um, but it is something that you need to talk to your doctor about because uh, there are lots of lots of different options. 
Uh, and then lastly on that list, um, there. Exercise is really, really beneficial for CIPN and, and, and managing CIPN symptoms. We've had lots of patients report to us that exercise has helped with the impact of their symptoms, particularly with balance, particularly with physical function, particularly with things like range of movement. So there's a really good evidence base for exercise being really helpful. Um, I, I think one of the key things that Beth and I often talk to here with people about is what we see and understandably is is people experiencing really not very nice symptoms often in the hands and feet which make them really uncomfortable which are really unpaid which are really painful which make things really difficult and our natural reaction sometimes is to over protect or not necessarily over protect but protect and stop doing things with our with our hands and, and stop moving as much and actually what we know about that is that can be really detrimental because the moment we stop doing things, our bodies get weaker. Um, and then that has a, a massive impact on what happens when we try to do things again. And we find that people's experience of their CIPN symptoms can be made, can feel worse if your body is weaker, if you've done less with your hands and feet and therefore they're even more sensitive. So I think a key message here is, is to try and do things as much as possible, as obviously within what's safe we number one we want to think about safety and if it's not safe to do then don't but within what is safe to try and keep your hands and feet engaged in activity and keep them doing things even if perhaps it's a little bit more frustrating than than it has been before keeping them doing things can be really really helpful absolutely agree with that Great. and Good. i think going back to that sort of motorway analogy it also mm -hmm. reinforces we want to still send the messages to those nerves. Mm. We don't want that pathway. We want to, to promote that circulation of neural pathways. So mm. an exercise can be a brilliant way of, of doing that. Yeah, absolutely. I've seen, I've seen exercise pop questions just pop up as well, Beth. <laughs> <laughs> um, just staying on this symptom management sort of control component um, and sort of a, a and add on to the exercise side of things. Another thing we want to think about is, is the falls management and the falls prevention side of things, because we know that potentially your balance might be affected if you're experiencing CIPN symptoms in your feet and reducing the risk of falls is really important. We don't want you falling over. That's not going to do any of us any good. So thinking about trip, trip hazards and um, mobility equipment if necessary and exercise to help reduce the risk of falls you know all is really important as well then just on the rest of this side just i'm going to briefly touch on sort of a, a range of what we call sort of complementary therapies and that includes things like acupuncture reflexology um, again things that people have reported can help with or, or ha has helped with their cipn symptoms full disclosure evidence base wise we're still looking at very much an anecdotal evidence base but the anecdotal evidence base for people reporting that that helps is good uh, so they're things to consider uh, again things like yoga tai chi also things that have people have reported have been helpful mindfulness again something else that people talk about helping to to manage or managing the impacts of, of cipn symptoms and then again, just worth thinking about diet, about whether you've got a well-balanced diet and about particularly about whether you're sleeping, because what the evidence actually shows is particularly for sleep, if you aren't sleeping particularly well, your experience of your CIPN symptoms is likely to be worse. So actually, if you're if you've got a really well-balanced diet and you're getting some good sleep, um, that might help how how the CIPN symptoms feel and how they impact your everyday life. So just a few more things to think about within that treatment component. Uh, and then moving on to um, lastly, we have the restorative and, and sort of neural treatment components. We know that nerve, rec nerve recovery is possible. What's tricky is, is we can't make any guarantees and we're not entirely sure 
how it's going to work from person to person and how long it's going to take and to what extent you're going to get the recovery. But we know nerve recovery is possible. And like, you know, Beth just said, keeping moving and keeping your hands and feet involved are going to be sending the right sig signals to the nerves to, to try and help with some of those uh, restorative components. When Beth and I think about the, a more of a restorative um, therapeutic approach, we often look at it from a whole body approach as well. So what we aim for is strengthening the entire body, um, because we know that if your body is stronger and fitter, um, and you feel more confident with everyday tasks and therefore you're more active, that means it's more likely that your experience of your CIPN symptoms will be better. Um, and if you're feeling confident to be active, active, confident to do your everyday things, your quality of life, we would hope, would also be better, potentially also having a, an impact on how you're experiencing the CIPN. So the restorative side of things we, we do look at from a, a whole body um, view. So just on to sort of some summary top top tip ideas and we've got we weren't sure who, who what the audience breakdown was so we've got some top tips for clinicians and some top tips for patients um, so top tips for clinicians screening for CISPN symptoms as early as possible and referring on to supportive services ASAP the sooner we can see people to support with the symptom often the better the longer it's left the trickier it can sometimes be um, including severity and impact of the CIPN on function if you are doing referrals to other services is really helpful for us and just being realistic with with people about what our expectations for for the symptom are um, so that people are aware because uh, what I do find I hear a lot is people saying they just weren't told um, so yeah being realistic and um, for patients highlighting symptoms as early as you possibly can maintaining as, as normal a function as possible within what is safe again don't want anyone to be unsafe but within what's safe trying to do your everyday activities as best you can and keeping those hands and feet involved in things adhering to any management advice you're, you're given the honest truth i think about the management side of things is is all of it is or, or none of it should i say is necessarily going to instantly make things better and we only know if it's going to help if people consistently try and use the strategies that they've been advised to uh, for a good period of time, um, sometimes quite a long time. So it's not necessarily a quick fix. Um, and think about your safety. Your safety is really, really important. And we don't want you to injure yourself. We don't want you to fall over. We don't want you to cut yourself. So really thinking about safety um, is key. And I think it's OK to prompt your medical team if you are wanting to know more about CIPN, if you're thinking you're getting some symptoms, if you're worried that that might happen, prompt your team if they haven't asked you, ask them to talk to you about it, ask for them to screen. I think that's something we all find quite helpful. There's often a lot lot to try and sort of get across to people and it's fine to, to prompt us if it's something that you want to talk about. Um, and then here, this is the the clever slide um, that we were talking about with the um, little codes on um, and I think that that will be somewhere else for people later as well if that's helpful um, just to some helpful resources that might be useful moving forwards with some more advice um, from various different uh, organizations there and then our contact details for myself and Beth and sort of our service here we are aware that you know we are a specialist service and and we're very aware that not everybody has access to that where they're living um, and what we would really really encourage is that if you are struggling with 
functional day-to-day -day tasks because of your CIPN, then do ask your GP or your local team to refer you to your local therapy service. So your occupational therapist, your physiotherapist. No, they might not be cancer specialists, but they will be equipped to support you if you're struggling from a day-to-day -day point of view. Equally, if your CIPN is causing problems with your mobility, your walking, your balance, you're falling over, asking your local teams to refer you to your local physio service. Again, might not be a specialist service, but they will be well able to support you with how the symptoms are impacting on your everyday life. Um, and probably a GP may well be the best person locally, um, you know, all your local medical teams to talk to about that if you haven't got access to a more specialist service. And again, some of the links on the slide before are to places like Macmillan um, and Cancer Research that have sort of more specialist information as well. Um, so yeah, definitely do, do ask for those referrals. It's, it, it's available um, and, and therapy teams can support you. Thank you very much. Thank you. <laughs> Brilliant. Thank you both. It was a bit of a whistle stop tour. So while you yeah. catch your breath um, <laughs> before we plunge into questions, I'll, I'll do a bit of filling for you. Um, so I just want to say to everyone, thank you so much. We've had probably the most questions we've ever had at any one of these events. Um, a lot of people are asking questions that are, are quite technical in terms of, sort of their particular drug regime. So we, we're asking anyone who's got a question that's about their own specific care program and treatment program to contact our Ask the Nurse service, um, where the nurses there will be able to give a much more detailed answer. Um, so if you're ready, I'm going to plunge in, I'm going to whip through them um, in an attempt to get through them all. If we don't get a chance to answer every question, um, then we'll do our best perhaps with Beth and Lauren afterwards to get answers to questions and get them sent out. So, okay, first up, we've got a question here. Is it fairly common that CIPN worsens three to six months after completing chemo and then starts to get better. Is that normal? So I think, if you don't mind me answering this one, Please. Lauren. <laughs> <laughs> so I think normal is a difficult term and, and I think it's, there is a different trajectory for everyone. I don't think it's that uncommon for some patients to develop symptoms around that sort of time frame. Um, but it will set, it will differ so much for for everyone. So it's really difficult to say yes or no. Um, so I know that's yeah the well, world's most answer. annoying therapy answer. <laughs> <laughs> I think that's probably going to be one you might need on flashcards yeah. <laughs> for a few of these questions yeah. because we've also been asked. Um, I've been told I could experience CIPN in my throat as well and therefore mm. stay away from cold drinks and food. Mm. Is that normal? Mm. So, okay. <laughs> so yes, but it, that you can also yeah. get experience of symptoms in sort of the oral cavity. Um, again, it will, it will differ and it will depend. Certain regimes, they will tell you to avoid certain things because they know that you're more likely to develop those things. Mm. I guess it's also worth mentioning, we obviously speak a lot in our presentation about the sort of chronic CIPN presentation, mm. but that doesn't mean that just because if you experience some of these symptoms sort of more acutely, that they will go on to be as chronic as we're describing. Yeah. We're obviously quite a specialist centre and we do see people in the latter end of their yeah. treatment and actually experiencing those symptoms. Yeah. But then we don't ever see the people that have it as a transient symptom and then yeah. they're managing okay. So yeah. I guess that's just also worth bearing in mind. Yeah, that makes yeah. sense. Yeah, I think we signed all doom and gloom, but yeah. Don't <laughs> Okay, another is it common question. Um, I have post chemo neuropathy in my feet up as far as my knees. Is that common? Again, with, yeah, you're right. We probably should have put this on a card. Again, really annoying <laughs> therapy answer. It, it's not uncommon. Um, and, and definitely Beth and I see lots of people that, that do experience it further up the legs, a bit further up the arms. Again, it's there's no this is the way you should experience it. It's very different from person to person and that's not abnormal what you're experiencing. 
And I think that's probably why so many of the questions are asking mm. is this norm people just want yeah. to know yeah. this is this is something that you know I'm not the only one this is something that that you guys in your professional capacity yeah. see and that can offer some support for I guess that's why people are asking the question yeah, absolutely. and I think yeah. it's also worth mentioning that if something's new or worsening mm. it's always best to just go back to your your oncologist or your <laughs> CNS or you know it's always best to report those things yeah. because that the there is obviously other things that it it could be and actually like we said at the very beginning in some cases peripheral neuropathy so not cipn could be because of a b12 deficiency so there are other things so it's important that if it's new Mm. and if it you know it's a new symptom or it is worsening that actually we don't just put it down to this and it's not explored yeah and i think i think i don't know what you think beth you if you're experiencing CIPN symptoms, say say to someone you there is support. There are things people can do. You are entitled to, to see they, to see therapists to have this support. So don't suffer in silence. Tell someone on your medical team and and ask for some support for it. Absolutely. And that that leads really nicely into another question we've had, which is who who do we ask? Who do you ask? So I'm guessing. It's anyone on the team, but anyone. CNS would be a good place to start. CNS is always a great place to start. Yeah. Um, yeah, they're always, I mean, our CNS is absolutely fantastic. Um, some, so the our therapy team, you can actually self-refer directly to. So if you do have a similar service to ours or, or you are can access our service, you can self-refer. But anyone in your medical team, and I suppose if you're in a situation where you you haven't got that a a gp is probably the next port of call um you know and saying things like you know i want to be referred to my local therapy service every area has a therapy service there will be a therapy team in your area um so so jump up and down and say you want to be referred there that's the thing isn't it make a noise and make enough noise until someone listens (laughs) yeah exactly yeah (laughs) Um, This is a really interesting question and one that it actually crossed my mind when you were talking. So I'm really pleased that this person's asked it. Is this something the DVLA need to be notified of? Yes, there is. There is. That ties in really nicely because I had a note on one of my slides. Yeah, so you are meant to. um, I I can give you an extra link for this as well, which I actually forgot to include. You are meant to inform the DVLA if you've got peripheral neuropathy and you're planning on driving. I'm I'm probably going to stop stop there. Yeah, I think the the medical team tend to give you some advice in the mm. sense of like if you are able to safely perform an emergency stop. However, if yeah. there are some hesitancies within that or some issues with sensation yeah. in in doing so, yeah, then arguably your insurance could also be void. So it, yeah. it's actually just thinking about those those aspects of it yeah. as well as yeah, your the safety. The safety part. yeah the massive safety element i'll i'll give you the extra link um and it's a link brilliant. to the gov uh, advice specifically for that brilliant yeah. okay another question here um can it be caused by only oral or intravenous chemo or a combination of both i guess this is a question about you know, what can cause it yeah so yeah it's more frequently associated with intravenous however i think because of the nature of the oral doses, it might be that over a longer period of time, that accumulation could still cause some of those side effects, but it's certainly not something I've seen as much no. um, yeah. would be yeah. what I'd say. Yeah, I agree. Yeah, it's more le- less common with the oral, but that's not to say that it wouldn't happen. It doesn't happen. Yeah. I would be confident in answering this question myself because I was paying attention to your slides. So we've got somebody who wants to know if stress relief balls can be helpful for symptoms in the hands, squeezing the ball. I think you're going to say yes. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah, definitely. It promotes the circulation. It promotes the, the motor and sensory feedback into your hands. Yeah. It, it challenges your sensation and it might be actually an effective way of trying to get some desensitization. So it could work in a number of different, numerous different ways that Lauren sort of covered. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. 
really nice idea. Just be really something to just note um, if you're thinking about trying any of the sort of techniques that I appreciate we gave quite general advice. Um, but if you're thinking about trying any, just be really careful about keep making sure your skin, taking care of your skin, making sure that you're not damaging your skin, particularly if sensations reduced, just make sure that nothing is, is damaging your skin that you're just not aware of. But yeah, absolutely really helpful. So uh, um, I'm aware we're really close to running out of time. I'm going to try and squeeze a couple more in. Um, is there any dietary advice for CIPN? So a particular diet to follow, things to leave out of your diet, things to add in? Pass. Mm. I'd say there's usually really good di um, dietitians within sort of colorectal and yeah. bowel cancer pathways. So they would definitely be the best people to, to contact and again your your cns and i know it came up with what cns is so your clinical nurse specialist um they yeah. would they would be able to direct you but yeah. off the top of my head i i don't think so but again yeah. there might be and certainly just generally having a well-balanced diet you know we, we all know is helpful for loads of things and the thought is it's also helpful for this but yeah whether there's anything specific we'd probably need a bit more of a, a specialist dietitian. dietitian yeah so and then this is I, it's kind of less of a well, I don't know maybe it is a question but I think it's just a really interesting um, point that's been made mm. so this person says my neuropathy started about eight weeks after chemo ended mm. by which point I'd been discharged from oncology and I've actually heard this from a number of people in my yeah. support group so because of this we were classed as as having no neuropathy at the point of discharge and therefore it doesn't get picked up oh. so there's so the question here is is there any way this can be looked into so that patients are questioned about this later which clearly isn't a question for us to answer or solve yeah. but I think it it's a really interesting point isn't it that there clearly is a need to raise awareness and I'm thinking from yeah. bowel cancer UK's aware, uh, point of view we've got plans to do a huge amount of work with primary care in the coming um couple of you know next few months and and into next year and I think there's a real a real role there for us to play in helping GPs understand that yeah. this can present a little bit later on and therefore yeah. they may well have patients coming to them with this and how you pick that up yeah absolutely yeah. and absolutely. I think that almost it also feeds into why the literature in this field is so mm. patchy patchy because actually it, it's not uncommon for it mm. to happen after and then yeah. it's not yeah. that often that that cohort of patients will be sort of researched at that point it will be that they're sort of monitored throughout a pathway yeah. and within that yeah um, and I think if we can get the education better at the beginning which is tricky because you have to find the right time point for people but if we can get people's understanding of of that this might happen and it might happen later down the line so people are better equipped for actually identifying it themselves and saying actually I was told that this might happen I recognize some of these symptoms and I can now go to my GP and say actually I have been discharged but I was told this and and it fits in with what I'm now experiencing you know please I want some support great more work for all of us to do yeah. <laughs> which is is where we're going to leave it so yeah. enormous enormous thanks to both lauren and to you beth for for giving up your your evening and your time um we've got so many questions that we haven't had a chance to to answer live Sorry. so apologies to everyone whose questions have gone unanswered um but we will absolutely be asking um lauren and beth to, to to answer any that they can including the one about exercise and somebody asked are there any exercise tips that you can give so that's one for you to be thinking about <laughs> so brilliant there is now just a little I think a few slides for me to do, um, which is just telling everybody who's still watching a little bit about um, Bowel Cancer UK and our services and how we can help. So do stick with us for another couple of minutes if you can, that would be brilliant. So first up, just to let everybody know, we run a number of Facebook groups. Um, we have one for stage four patients, we have one for caregivers, so those partners and, and friends and carers who've joined us tonight, if you're not aware of our Facebook group, there's a, a closed group that you can join, one on immunotherapy and a new one on pelvic exenteration um, surgery, so you can head to our website if you'd like to know a little bit more about how you can join 
those. We also have our online forum, which is a, a fantastic online community um, for everyone affected by bowel cancer. Um, there are thousands of people on there willing and ready to share their experiences, answer questions and just give support. So um, head on over if that sounds like something that you would find really helpful. We also run um, something called chat together now chat together is like they're like online support groups they run for six weeks over zoom um, and a, a small group of people sign up and then they're facilitated by one of our brilliant moderators and volunteers who are trained um, but also have lived experience of bowel cancer themselves you can see there that we run them for different groups of patients so we run advanced um, bowel cancer ones we once right we currently run whales specific ones uh, we run them for people with a stoma as well as stages one to three um, and again you can sign up find out a bit more about them on our website so if you haven't already discovered our website and all of our amazing health information, then do head over. Um, we do have a booklet that contains quite a lot of information about peripheral neuropathy um, on our website. You can order some of our publications to be sent um, so you can have a printed copy sent to you, but all of them can be downloaded and printed at home. So again, head over to the website if you'd like more information. Um, for those of you, and there were, I think, three um, people joining us from Wales, we do have a specific programme of activity in Wales. I'm not even going to attempt that in Welsh. Um, but if you want to find out more about how you can get involved with the Wales specific um, uh, activities and services, then again, head over to our website. Uh, for those of you who um, have had a fantastic experience with a particular nurse who's been part of your care team. We have just opened our nominations for this year's Gary Logue Colorectal Cancer Nurses Award. So every year we um, not we we award um, a cancer nurse specialist who has been put forward, nominated by a patient who has just been particularly outstanding and amazing in the level of support and care that they've they've given. Now we know all nurses are brilliant. But if you have had a particularly amazing experience with one of those really special nurses and you would like to make a nomination, then you can head either to our website or you can scan the QR code there and you can make your nomination. And who knows, come September, we might be announcing your nurse as this year's winner. Um, anyone in Wales who wants to do the Gower Peninsula Sunset Trek? Um, and raise a bit of money for us, then I've been asked to do a bit of a plug for that. Um, I can't guarantee you'll see a view like that, but, but I hope, absolutely hope so. Um, and we currently also are trying a new fundraising product, which is um, Swim 15. So it's a swimming challenge. Um, the 15 comes from the fact that every 15 minutes, someone's diagnosed with bowel cancer in the UK. So this is a, a sponsored event that you organise yourself and you just swim something connected with 15. Might be swim every day for 15 days, might be swim 15 laps, might be swim 15 miles I don't know if you fair play if that's what you if that if you can um, but if you want to get involved again details are on our website um, if water's not your thing but air is and you want to jump out of a plane um, and do a skydive for us then again that's something that any thrill seekers out there can can get involved in so that is it from me again one more huge thank you to Lauren and to Bethany for joining us tonight. Enormous thanks to the Bowel Cancer UK team who've been working behind the scenes, answering questions and making sure the tech works. And most of all, an, a, a massive thank you to all of you for joining us. The evaluation link is currently in the chat. You will get sent it by email afterwards and we'll be sending you out, obviously, the link to the video um, as well as, as the evaluation and all of the results. Courses. So I've overrun ever so slightly. Really sorry. I hope I'm not keeping anyone from anything important. Have a lovely evening, everyone. Take care. <laughs>